Hi, this is Andrew Sears again, and in this section I'm going to go through nine cross-cultural leadership lessons. And really, this is kind of the summary of the practical lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, a lot of the other stuff I presented was concepts, but these are very trying to bring it down to practical um, ideas. So number one is it's really important to understand the cultural degrees of separation to be able to assess cultural distance. So um, one of the optional readings in this course was Ralph Winter, where he represented cultural degrees of separation he, in evangelism. So E0 was the same culture. E1 was one degree removed. E2 is two degree removes, removed. Um, you don't really need to read that um, paper, although it's very helpful. But what, what's important is to recognize not all cultural distance is the same. Um, and there's key dimensions that may influence degrees of separation or distance. So race or ethnicity. Um, can create, you know, one dimension of, of separation. Social class, you know, are you poor, working class, middle class, upper class, gender, language, um, immigrant generation, are you first generation immigrant? If you're an immigrant, are you second, third, um, your country of origin, Christian versus non-Christian, and then you have various denominations, and then you have organizational values alignment. So, um, you know, as you you learn these dimensions, you're going to learn that they, how they affect your cultural distance based on your knowledge of yourself and other cultures and experience. So um, the second lesson really is how that applies. So this is what I call a cross-cultural sphere of influence, and I'm actually mapping this out for myself personally. Um, so I grew up poor or poor slash working class in a white and black community. Um, and even though I've spent a lot of my life trying to, you know, learn to be cross-cultural outside of that, that's still my tier one. Whenever I work with people from tier one, um, often I have the least cross-cultural distance. So the tier two, um, which is, you know, one degree removed um, for me, and, and I actually grew up, you know, attending black churches. I, even though I'm white, I um, grew up um, talking like I was African-American because um, I was surrounded by African-American community. So that's part of why. Um, now, the next tier is uh, those that are coming from poor white, white middle class, um, and um, maybe second genera generation uh, Latino, Latina, or Asian working class. Um, and I realize I had black working class at the top. I think that that's a m mistake there. Um, and that's really the next year. You know, whenever I work with staff coming from these backgrounds, I generally do fairly well. Um, it's not as much of a challenge. Um, and then the third tier is um, is the next tier. So someone who might be black or African American coming from poor or middle class background. Um, or someone who's first generation, um, or they're poor or middle class, Latino or Latina or Asian, um, Asian American, um, and then white upper middle class women, and then international people who are in, in the middle class um, who might have an other language, um, you know, that, that's dominant. So I've supervised staff in all of these categories, um, and I've had to adapt. Um, the most for people in tier three. Um, and, you know, if I get outside of those, these tiers, um, it's really beyond my competency level. So, um, and it's just something you know about yourself. And you, you obviously shouldn't use this as a way to discriminate, and you have to actually work actively against it. And I'll talk about that in one of the other principles. So, um, the third thing that actually builds on this is um, there's a guy, John Maxwell, who's a very famous um, Christian leadership um, writer, and he talks about something called the law of the lid. And the basic idea is that if, say, you're a level eight leader, um, then you can only supervise leaders that are level seven. Because honestly, if someone's a level nine leader, um, then they should probably be leading you. Um, so, or they're going to go to, you know, their own organization. Um, so that's the idea behind the law of the lid. And the idea is you want to try to grow your leadership level. Now, cross-culturally, how this applies is your leadership level is actually going to vary across different groups. So someone might be a level eight leader with white middle-class 
are middle class men, but they might be a five with black upper middle class women. Um, so each person will have different cross-cultural spheres of influences or leadership levels across various groups given their, their cultural background, identity, and personality. So for me, you know, let's say I'm a level eight in this middle, I'd probably be a level seven at tier two or level six at, at tier three. I mean, that's just like an estimate, but it might um, actually vary. Um, so the next principle um, that's actually related to this, actually this is kind of a sub-principle under it, is how the cross-cultural law of the lid plays out organizationally. And honestly, this is really why um, so many organizations are led by white male um, middle-class leaders or Western leaders. So um, what happens is you get um, someone who is a white male middle-class leader, and their leadership level is an eight um, among white men. Um, but for someone who's Asian, it might be seven. Someone who's black might be six. And, you know, if you add gender in there, you might, you know, lose another. Um, Latino, Latina might be a four. Um, so if you have a, a female or a different class difference, you'd reduce that by one. So all of a sudden, this person's not able to lead people in different, you know, categories. So this person leads a white male middle class level seven leader. Um, and, you know, you can see over here, that person has 15 largely white staff. Um, and then that per this person, because he is able to supervise, um, you know, his leadership level six, um, this is obviously just an estimate for anyone. It's not like there's a number by our head or something. Um, he's able to, to supervise a level five leader, uh, a female working class leader, um, and that leader might supervise someone who's a black male working class leader who's who's level three. Um, and then you might have a Latino leader over here. And the challenge is that your strongest leaders are going to be those who are culturally the most similar to you. So then there's you just kind of create this um, cultural momentum is is what it would be called of, of uh, you know, leadership selection. And that's a challenge. And, and part of what we have to do is is fight against that. So um, so I showed that the personal sphere of influence cross-culturally, and what that does is that actually can create an organizational cross-cultural influence. So as, as you as an organization, um, you know, as this plays out in your organization, you're going to have a uh, organizational cross-cultural sphere of influence. So um, City Vision University was founded out of the Association of Gospel Rescue Missions. Um, and it started off only serving evangelicals, serving the poor, um, largely adult, white, and black working class. So that's the tier one. Still, that's honestly the group that we serve the best. We're trying to serve others better, um, but that is the group that we, we serve the best. Then we have tier two. So that's going to be Christians and nonprofit professions, and that's largely um, adult, white, and black working class. And whenever I say working class, um, I'm really talking about people who identify more with, uh, and not just people who are blue collar, but people who've been immersed in blue collar communities. And, and part of what, if you read my, um, my paper on social class, your class is really determined more by who your friends are and who your community is um, and who you would call your people. Um, so it's not necessarily how much income that you're making. Um, and then the other group that we serve in tier two is program participants of evangelical programs serving the poor. So again, you know, we're best serving the adult, um, white and black working class. The next tier is, um, is, uh, we have international students and NGOs and, and parachurch ministries. We have Asian Latino Christians and nonprofit professions. Um, we have non-Christians um, seeking affordable nonprofit degree and Christians seeking affordable degrees. Um, so these are all the groups that we end up serving, and some we serve better than others. And part of what we're trying to do is to expand our cross-cultural sphere of influence while at the same time staying true to our mission. Um, and, you know, there's some groups out there that we're just not going to be the best at serving. So, um, you know, we're a Christian institution and we get some non-Christians that, that come here largely because they're looking for affordable degrees and we're not, um, you know, trying to be a hostile place to them. But at the same time, you know, I tell people, if you go to church, don't 
complain if someone preaches at church because you just went to church. So we're a Christian institution. That's going to happen here. Um, and uh, and that you know some people don't want that, so they're just not going to fit in, right? Um, and that's okay. That's why we have different organizations. So um, having said that, um, we got to recognize and work against the fact that most non-intentional systemic injustice is caused by the cross-cultural limits of dominant groups. So you know what happens is if you know, white men historically have had more um, power, education, and, and other things. What, what's going to happen is, you know, my limitation or other, you know, leaders' limitations of their cultural sphere of influence is going to create extra barriers, and I put in parentheses bias, um, and these are non-intentional, um, and that's the important part of this, um, for those more on the outside. So the resources tend to be concentrated in white, Western, middle and upper class and male. Um, I did a much longer presentation about uh, nonprofit funding bias and foundation diversity on this that got several thousand people to um, to view it. Um, you can read more detail about how that works. And, um, you know, the real goal is to achieve balance between stretching your personal and your organizational sphere of influence. So whenever I say, you know, develop a, a plan and you know your uh, personal um, EQ or, or um, cross-cultural I guess CQ um, then part of it what I want you to do is talk about your personal how do you expand your personal cross-cultural sphere of influence how do you expand your your organizational cross-cultural um, sphere of in influence and don't discriminate in ways that would perpetuate injustice but also don't mislead. So, you know, it's important that people know that City Vision is a Christian institution. We don't hide the fact and then all of a sudden, you know, people come in and they they feel like, oh, I got tricked. Um, but, you know, it, it's also good to know your cultural identity, stretch your identity, but live within your limits of your identity. You know, everyone's seen, you know, videos of a, you know, white kid from the suburb trying to act like he is, um, he he's uh, African American, um, and that's just you know, or you know, whatever cultural um, dynamic that's outside of someone's limit. So, um, you know, what we're trying to do, you know, using this diagram that I showed before, is we're trying to be the bridge. So we're trying to stretch an organization's cross-cultural um, limits to maximize its long-term mission effectiveness. So, um, step. Or, or I guess the principle six is going to be to conduct evaluation to get an honest measure of an organization's cultural sphere of influence. So you can do that through your client. So you assess the demographics of your participants. Um, and, you know, a lot of times people make the mistake of only looking at the people who are showing up. They actually, the most significant thing is the people who don't show up. Um, whenever we looked at City Visions, you know, uh, analysis on this that that was the, the biggest factor or one of the biggest factors I looked at you know ex ass assess your success rate and complaints of clients across key cultural dimensions city vision whenever we looked at this we did deep analysis on our success rate across demographic um, we also look at you know the complaints and, and you know whenever I, I drew those different um, tiers on our cross-cultural sphere of influence that's largely what I was reflecting um, so what's the difference in success rates across race and ethnicity, other factors? Um, if the success rates are much lower for key target groups, then honestly, you're not focused enough on meeting the cultural needs of your clients. So if you're running a rescue mission or a recovery group pro um, and you notice that the, the white clients have an 80% you know, success rate in your program, the black clients have a 40% success rate, there's probably a significant part of that has to do with your cross-cultural sphere of influence. So um, there's also ways you can actually get this, you know, data-wise. There's a sample diversity data for, form at, at uh, this website. Um, and then you, that's on the client side. There's those with resources. Um, you can look at what are key fa factors that they value that you're lacking. Um, you know, I was a part of a low-income church, and they wanted to be able to bring in more middle-class folks, but they... Um, you know, there are just different things that, um, you know, the pastor, whenever he, he went and he uh, tried to get his master's degree, I think it helped him understand some of the things that um, 
you know, he needed to develop in the organization um, to do that. So, you know, do you have adequate staffing to meet the needs of those with resources, fundraising, accounting, volunteer management, and, you know, diagnosis if you can't access adequate resources. So if you're perpetually poor, you're probably not doing very well cross-culturally for those with resources. How do you expand your sphere of influence in that direction? Um, so City Vision's done deep analysis on this. So the factors that we found improved student success rate, um, the top two um, were uh, those who come in with transfer credits and those who end up paying their own tuition. The factors that had very limited impact on success rate, um, race was very small, gender um, was almost none, and then whether people had Pell Grants was, was also very small. Um, factors that lowered success rate for us, our average age of our students is age 40, um, and we're really not um, trying to compete with, you know, students who want to go to campus and have a coming of age experience. Um, you know, we're not, we're not competing with the average Christian college where people are going to go to campus. Um, people who had no transfer credits, um, you know, we're primarily about degree completion. People who took federal student loans, that's part of why we stopped taking student loans and city vision internships. So each of those areas, we've actually deprioritized our, um, you know, ways that we focus and, you know, even in communicating with people, we try to say, okay, you're not going to get the campus experience here, you know, are you sure that's what you want? Um, you know, part of what we noticed was there are demographic groups that had limited per participation, and we currently have theories on, on why that is, but we want to better understand, um, you know, Asian Americans, um, I think our, our current theory right now is that a lot of Asian Americans uh, put a priority on um, going to schools that have a, a strong name brand. You know, we're, we're not Harvard, right? So we're, we're affordable. We're going to help, um, you know, people serve the poor. Latino, Latina, one of the, the things that I've seen is that Latino and Latina have um, significantly less participation in online courses and much stronger in community colleges. Um, and then under 25, um, that's just a group that, as I mentioned, I think there's ways that we're just not going to serve in the ways they're looking for. Um, so, um, you know, the factors that influence access to resources, accounting capacity, no dedicated fundraising staff, no volunteer management, no staff devoted to alumni support. Those are all things that we need to improve. So factors that will make cross-cultural challenges more difficult for individuals. This is the seventh thing. So um, as I've supervised people, I found, you know, some people may not be that, that far cross-culturally, but if they're not a fit with our organizational values, um, so there's this phrase that often is, is used um, from the, the book Good to Great. You, you know, whenever you're leading, you try to get all the people on the right bus, that means that you're a good fit with organizational values. And then the second part is on the right seat on the bus. So how strong is the alignment of the person with the requirements of their position? So what I found is in ministries, they really focus on getting the right people on the bus. But then you get people who have great hearts and they're doing an accounting position, but they should really be a pastor and they're horrible at accounting. And then you fail an audit because um, you think that they're, you know, good values, but they can't do what you're asking them to do. Um, and other factors, just how healthy is the organization overall? And a lot of times that has to do with financial health. It isn't emotional health. It's, um, you know, if the organization is financially strained, um, that's going to make it more difficult cross-culturally. So if any of these are off, it will make cross-cultural challenges much more difficult. Um, some organizations, and as I talked about our history, we push justice too far to the point where it creates organizational dysfunction that decreases its organizational sphere of influence. And, and that hurt not just us with resources, but it hurt those that we are serving our clients. Um, other organizations, I would say, cheat, and they gain a short-term performance benefit of not stretching cross-culturally. Um, and in churches, there's a whole church growth philosophy that, that's what's called the homogeneous unit principle. And there's been studies that have shown that if you do churches that are culturally all one culture, they grow more quickly. Um, but then there's a problem with that. And um, if you read the book um, Divided by Faith, it gets a lot into the, the problems with that. And I, I would say that it's kind of like a performance enhancing drug. It works in the short term, but not necessarily in the long term. Um, then step eight or, or the eighth point is to develop a plan to grow your personal cross-cultural sphere of influence. So 
this plan and this gets into the assignment for this course um, you know think about ways that you're going to grow yourself um, this is like a personal development plan so you know are you going to read are you going to take courses this course could be one of them you know watching videos learning the language there's a period where I was working in a Latino community and I signed up to take Spanish um, you know I attended a Latino church for 10 years um, and then there's the hard effect of cross-cultural friendships attending a cross-cultural church as a minority immersion this is you know CCDA's relocation immersion in, in a cross-cultural community as a minority um, I found the most significant though is being supervised cross-culturally um, so if you're white being supervised by someone who's black that's going to help you grow more than anything else or if you're from a you know upper middle class being supervised for, from someone from a working or, or poor class um, and then the hand psychomotor you know you have to learn um, to manage people cross-culturally by doing it um, so working cross-culturally with peers um, and serving cross-culturally with clients and it's important to make that distinguish uh, a distinguishing factor is um, sometimes you're being supervised that's going to cross cause the most growth whenever you're just you're the helper that's going to create the least growth generally um, because you're in a position of power so um, the last thing is to develop a plan to grow your organization cross-cultural sphere of influence so you can do situational analysis is generally how you do strategic plans so you develop a cross-cultural assessment plan do interviews analyze data diagnose problems and that can go into the first parts of your um, of your project um, and then you develop a plan develop goals and outcomes that stretch the organization beyond its limit but but not beyond its limit sorry um, staffing strategy your personal some personal plan and then you develop action items from the assessment so to diagnose what portion of the problem is and this is actually really important is your problem more with clients or is it more with access to resources and prioritize based on that so if it, if it's you know you have more of a problem cross-culturally with clients you might have a much higher percentage of your effort focused on that and um, you you figure out how much of your efforts going to go into serving each of the tiers of your cross-cultural sphere of influence so your your core tier you're obviously going to continue to put effort but then you're going to also have effort at other tiers determine where leadership personally needs to expand their cross-cultural sphere of influence or hire additional leaders um, and then resource objectives you're going to have to grow administratively accounting board development fundraising determine where leadership personally needs to expand their professional capacity or hire um, additional leaders um, so this is just an example of city vision and this hasn't been finalized but just off the top of my head I, I kind of pulled this together um, at our tier one you know we're not abandoning our core you know the, the core where we started our tier one still going to be 70 percent of our, our students um, and we're going to try to improve the quality of how we're serving them so um, and we primarily serve Christians that serve the poor and you know a lot of our effort is going to be going towards that so we're going to try to improve the quality of our undergraduate programs improve the quality and scope of our graduate programs and personally I'm doing a lot of work to try to increase my expertise and best practices in online education um, and others on our team are doing that too I've created a course to help our team do that or se actually several courses um, secondly participants from Christian nonprofits serving the poor um, so we serve the leaders of these Christian nonprofits really well um, but those who are poor themselves recently homeless recently addicted we found that they're not succeeding as well so we need to improve our support systems for them we need to develop courses and programs that have um, rapid job placement that's one of the big things that students need if you're homeless you need a job really quick um, develop non-credit um, and credit combination MOOCs that can be done as a group um, one of the things with this population is often um, at rescue missions or other places the course will be done as a group um, so these are going to be blended um, learning and personally what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to work really closely with a few partners where I'm learning all all of that I can from them on the ground and then the third tier is international students and NGOs or parachurch ministries we're, we're trying to grow there um, whenever I say 10% um, it's not that I'm not putting you know enormous effort on that it's just that's probably going to be 10% of our students um, and that's growth um, and we're trying to, to improve our global cross-cultural sphere of influence improve the contextualization of our courses um, globally 
Um, and personally, I'm doing a lot of things to try to grow in cross-cultural expertise, um, both in my own learning and attending conferences and even the, the projects that we're doing. So um, that's on the student objective. So that's the client side. But really, honestly, our bigger problem with City Vision, as you heard from our story, is our resources. So we're doing a lot to build the administrative capacity. Um, so our staff, myself, Evan especially, has done an enormous amount of effort to gain experience in financial aid regulations. Um, I'm trying to become an expert in best practices on online institutions. Um, I, uh, we've worked to hire detail-oriented staff trying to hire more, and um, we've tried to develop and enforce extensive policies and procedures, um, and do, um, yeah, so the next area is fundraising capacity. Um, Oh, I, th this last point is just saying that we're trying to do more or organizational objectives um, that, that we're working on, so this isn't finalized at all. Um, the fundraising capacity, you know, personally, for the first time in my life, I'm attending a um, upper middle class church. Um, actually, it's the first time in the past 23 years um, or 22 years I'm attending an upper, upper middle class church. Um, this is an immersion experience for me. You know, I spent too long, as I mentioned before, you know, judging rich people, so I'm doing the op kind of the opposite where I'm learning to how do you how do you learn to not judge a group of people well live among them for a while <laughs> so that's part of what I've been doing um, and I'm not you know losing my connection with with those in the hood but at the same time um, you know I feel like this is what God's called me to so organizationally we're developing a strategy um, with our existing network of influencers and there's a lot more work that we have to do there. Um, so that's it. So my my hope is that this would give you ideas of what to put in your final project. It doesn't have to be all all the things like this, but I wanted to give you some more ideas. So thanks a lot.